as we start to look at this graph right here and thinking about how, you know, as you get into those uh, productive years, I guess, uh, when it comes to, or responsible years maybe is a better way of putting it, uh, that that late 25s, early 30 year old group is the largest section of, of people out there. And this is the US population, obviously. It doesn't reflect a lot, but this is a good trend and we see this happening. That's something to look forward to. That's something to look forward to as an opportunity to have more, more, more drinkers, more wine drinkers at this point in time. And as we start, as we see it from the last, going back to the last slide, as when you get into those, those drinking ages, those are your prime years, your 40s and your 50s. Those are some good years for drinking. That's where I am right now. I found uh, electrical meters that were on the wrong rate. There was just one, one single electrical meter saved, saved me $50,000 a year by changing it to another rate. Um, and I guess we had missed that. We found um, places where water was going off property to another property from our wells. Um, so we can, you know, tighten that up. <laughs> we found leaks uh, in places where, where the water going out of the pump wasn't the same as that was arriving at the winery. So there's, uh, there's a whole lot of operational things that you can actually uh, find in, in doing your, your calculations. As far as when I think about what is private label uh, in adult beverage specifically, uh, you know, the, the most basic definition would be anything we want our guests to know is exclusively available at Target. Um, Target's incredibly uh, conservative about how we can message that or, or how we define it uh, when we're speaking to our guests. So you'll never see us come out and say, California Roots is only at Target or it's exclusively at Target, um, but we do a lot <laughs> and a lot to imply it. Um, so with that comes, uh, first and foremost, it needs to deliver on our, this is gonna sound super cheesy, but it's real, our expect more pay less promise. Um, everything we put on the shelf absolutely needs to over deliver uh, for the price point that we're asking. Um, and that that's something we will never uh, settle on or, or it's a non-negotiable. If you don't own it, you don't control it. And that is true for everything in life. If you don't own your own wine brand, you do not control that wine brand. If you don't own your own house, you do not control where you live. You may be renting, but you don't live there and you don't control it. And you have to be okay with it. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but that needs to be an awareness. And it's something I really, really struggled with for years when I was working in corporate winemaking, is I would see what I would do if I was the brand owner and it might be different or it might be the same. And if it was different, I really struggled with that. So I, this was my mantra for years. If I don't own it, I don't control it. And I needed to be okay with that. So if you're an employee or if you're an advisor or if you're a consultant and you're helping someone else on their project, if you don't own it, you have no control over that outcome. You can give them the best advice you can, but don't let it bother you in the long run if they don't take it. So why would you use barrel alternatives in wine? Barrels have been used forever. It's proven, it works. You put wine in, mostly, most of the time you put wine in the barrel, it comes out better than it, than it was when it went in. Um, but there is no more efficient, more sustainable, and more cost-effective way to oak up a wine than by using uh, barrel alternatives. And when you think about uh, the practicality in the cellar and efficiency, uh, it's a heck of a lot easier to manage one 15,000 gallon tank than it is 250 barrels, right? There's a, there's a crew that, that is involved, there's sampling, you know, monthlies and topping and treating. It's a lot of work and it takes people and resources. Um, and then when you talk about sustainability, that's a big, that's a big deal for us. Water, it takes a lot of water to wash and rewash and wash again a barrel. It takes a lot of trees to make barrels. You know, it takes, a, and you get about one to two barrels out of each tree that gets cut down. The other type of supplier um, to, you know, as with everything with bulk wine, there's a lot of maybes and there's a lot of overlap. You know, it's a big Venn diagram, but uh, with, with the other type of suppliers, these are really spot market suppliers. And annual bulk wine producers are also spot market suppliers because they have wine available year round and you can call them and you can buy it. But also part of that are the smaller wineries that are really um, focused on rebalancing supply. So this is where estate wineries, um, more niche wineries, that maybe they have a few thousand gallons extra. They're uh, 
they're making that wine available and they're, they're generally making it available to people like us because they don't have the wherewithal to sell it themselves and they don't want to, so they, they entrust it to the brokers. The nice thing about these spot market sales is that you get very unique opportunities for, for really strong supply. And if you're a negotiant and you're doing private label business with retailers, this is where you get those, what you see is what you get, the, the, the one-time buys. And also if you have an established brand and you need a real quality kick, you can achieve that with these spot market suppliers because oftentimes they're incorporating more oak or riper fruit flavors or higher alcohol wines that can elevate a base blend. We're creating this whole new kind of wine that nobody's ever heard of, clean crafted. And we're gonna sell it online, a place that back in 2015, most people are not buying wine. People are not comfortable in 2015 with buying wine online. So we considered, what drives people to buy wine? What drives consumers to make purchasing decisions about wine? So first, who buys, who's the primary buyer of wine? Women. We are the primary buyers of wine. We also drive most of the purchasing decisions in our home, in the for what it's worth bucket. Um, and we buy wine based on three things, y'all. What our friends are drinking, the story behind the wine, and of course, we all know this, the label. So after you design a beverage, you need to develop your beverage. So three things, technology, the liquid, and the packaging. So technology. So you're gonna need a way, again, to disperse this hydrophobic cannabinoids. The majority of way of doing that is making an emulsion. So the emulsion is not one emulsion that fits all liquids. You're gonna to have to really think about what emulsion you want to add to your base liquid. So in terms of emulsions, these are emulsifiers and surfactants. So you're gonna to have to decide what do you want on your ingredient deck? A natural sounding emulsifier, like a starch, or maybe a chemically sounding emulsifier, like sorbitan monosterate. There's pros and cons to both and you have to weigh those out. So um, what you have to weigh out is clarity. For me, a wine infused cannabis beverage should be clear, but that's where you have to think about your emulsions because a lot of emulsions will impart haziness.